Bluetooth mode. So we'll begin now. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Adding more joy to your and our Republic Day celebration. Today we have the company of a renowned archaeologist who would be sharing his thoughts on scientific archaeological genetical and craniofacial data in context to recent archaeological and genetic research carried out at various Harappan sites. I am Nikhil and may I have the pleasure of welcoming our esteemed speaker and guest to our first public lecture of 2022. Although we are meeting virtually, but this medium has enabled us to connect with our well-wishers from across the globe and I welcome each one of you for today. In our previous lecture, we discussed the word of Jain manuscript paintings, but today, Professor Sinde will be speaking on the topic, Our Culture and Genetic Roots, in the light of recent research at Rakhigadi. Before I invite our speaker to deliver his talk, may I briefly introduce Professor Sinde. Sir is the former professor and vice chancellor of the Deccan College, Pune. He is the founding director general at National Maritime Heritage Complex, Gandhinagar and is presently a CSIR Bhatnagar Fellow at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad. Sir is a world-renowned archaeologist and one of the foremost scholars in South Asia. He has directed a vast number of excavations around the country and has been directed an extremely prestigious international research project at the largest Harappan site of Rakhigadi in Haryana. Now I hand over this session to our speaker and request him to deliver his talk. So you can begin now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I extend my greetings to all on the occasion of the Republic Day of the country. I'm extremely happy to be here today and uh, I have taken this opportunity to thank the, uh, the authorities of the National Museum for inviting me uh, for this uh, public lecture today. Uh, friends, I am going to speak about the research that uh, we have been doing for the last uh, couple of years uh, on the uh, Harappan people and uh, how this research is, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, changing the perspective of our uh, Indian history. So I'm going to shed some light on that. And I'm going to uh, present, present my lecture with the help of the... Hello, <coughs> sir, sir, you're on mute, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. My PPT was clear or? Yes, sir. Is it visible? Okay. okay. <clears throat> Okay, now this is the topic of my research today, of my uh, talk today. Our cultural and genetic roots in the light of recent research at Rakhigadi. Now, before I, you know, uh, give you the account of the research that we are doing at the site of Rakhigadi, I would like to mention about the Harappan civilization, you know, which was discovered exactly 100 years ago in the 1921, January, February, the research started at Harappa and simultaneously at the site of Mohenjo-daro. So we are celebrating the centenary year. And the importance of Rakhigadi in Indian history, it is that you know we have the largest Harappan city, which is much more bigger than the city of Mohenjo-daro. 
we have also very early dates for the beginning of the harappan culture and it is here that you know we have understood the cultural development transformation from the early or the formative stage to the you know urban state of the harappan people so that you know, these aspects are you know quite clear from our research now the research, the you know some of the issues you know early in an history they are you know the aryan invasion or migration still we know that this is a my you know this is a myth but still we persist with this particular issue in indian history we still have a uh, little idea or no idea about you know people responsible for the cultural developments in south asia also the vedic culture and indo european language we have very little idea about that our research is you know also you know extending on this line also earlier hypotheses were based on science unscientific you know merely on inferences but now you know we are talking about the scientific data that we are generated and now for the first time of course we have generated this data and three types of data are i'm going to discuss today it is not that you know i'm going to only speak one data but we have archaeological data we have genetic data and also cranio facial data and all this you know when we synthesize this data you know this different evidences then you know the picture that is emerging it's very interesting about which i am going to speak now our research approach was very very clear in fact now initially we planned this research only by indian scholars the excavation was carried out by indians the dna was extracted by us by indians then also the sequencing was done the interpretation was done and we were about to publish this you know public so research in 2016 but uh, then we realized that you know that uh, there will be a lot of criticism from people from outside india particularly the european and, and american scholars and uh, they might say that maybe you know you have missed this part this aspect you know this methodology is not correct this you know, analysis needs to be done so what we decided that you know we decided to involve the you know foreign scholars Uh, who are topmost scholars in the respective field and they we ask them to do the crossing of our of our research of our results that we we obtain and only after we got the you know results from the foreign scholars then we decided to publish this research in 2019 then it was a research which was carried out you know uh, it was a multidisciplinary research uh, involving archaeology genetic history and various other sciences and also multi institutions were also were involved deccan college then the government of haryana this uh, center for cellular and molecular biology in hyderabad they were involved in the research and then we also roped in the institutions abroad like the uh, the uh, medical uh, school of uh, seoul national university in seoul in korea and also the medical school from harvard they also were involved and the medical school in harvard which has got one of one of the best forensic laboratories in the world now there uh, nearly 16 scientists were working from different parts of the country on the rakigadi samples that you know we provided so there were nearly 16 countries in part 16 or 17 countries involved in this particular research now little you know one small you know mistake that we have made in fact in our publication we published two papers one in shell and one in science and in both the papers it is mentioned uh, that uh, after 2000 bc the you know the aryans or the indo europeans began to you know move into indian subcontinent that is not true because after we analyze our archaeological and cranio facial data and also when we look re looked at the data that we have generated particularly the genetic data then we realize that you know this is you know we should not have mentioned that but i just want to you know bring to your notice also when we published this in 2019 there are a lot of criticisms some say that you know it is a politically oriented research some say that the data is very small and we cannot really you know make anything out of this 
but let me tell you that you know this particular research the research on ancient dna began in 2006 uh, in a, at the site of farmana one of the objectives of our research at farmana was to understand the harappan people and we tried very hard to extract dna from the uh, skeletal remains of the harappan people at farmana but due to our maybe maybe a wrong methodology the methodology that we we were adopting was not suited for dna research so because of that you know we faced failure that time but then you know after we came in contact with korean scientists particularly they suggested us to you know modify or maybe approach to the excavation which we did at the site of rakhigadi and then you know because of that you know we 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 you know succeeded but suppose you know in 2006 suppose we had we had succeeded in getting dna we would have published in 2009 or 10 and the results would have been the same so one should not criticize that this is a politically oriented research and yes we know that you know the data is small but you know in case of you know genetic history even if you have you know data from small it gives indication about the larger population so it is like you know testing a rice a grain of rice to to find out whether the rice is cooked or not so it is like that so this criticism also is not really valid in this respect so as far as the rna issue is concerned now this is intentionally created but you know the beginning is quite you know you know goes back to 16th century there was one Filippo Sassetto, the uh, the italian scholar and he for the first time realized that you know similarity between indian languages particularly sanskrit and italian languages so there you know he thought that you know, maybe the both of them have the same base then later in 1786 the founder of so you know ascetic society william jones now he was impressed by sanskrit language and he also noticed similarity with the gothic and and celtic language and there also he suggested that both of them have the same maybe foundation or the same root and in 1830 thomas young in fact he proposed the term indo-european then in 1840 german linguist uh, max muller now he found the word aria uh, in our rigvedic text and he thought that you know, this is the this is the term for the for the tribe or for the people <coughs> And he thought that, and see, you know, the mention was that, you know, the people were quite, quite advanced. So the Europeans thought that, you know, that uh, the Indians cannot be advanced. So they thought that, you know, Aryans must have come from outside. So from Arya, it became Aryan. And initially, Max Muller suggested that Aryans came from outside. But later, you know, and, and that is highlighted in fact in our textbooks only, in our, in our writing. But later, the same scholar, he realized his mistake and he said that you know aryan is not a racial but it is a linguistic term nobody refers to that because some scholars who oppose this you know aryan you know aryan or you know which is uh, a mythological or you know a myth now they found the first version of max Müller quite convenient and they said that max Müller has suggested that aryans came from outside and they continued with that particular statement later also. Then British colonials, you know, they also fostered the idea of superior Aryan race that moved into India from Europe through steppy regions. Now, why they did that? Because the Britishers came here and they gave the you know impression to the world that the Indians are you know backward, they're illiterate, and uh, you know we want to you know you know, make these people civilize and therefore, you know, we can justify our rule over India. But when this Harappan culture, Harappan civilization was discovered, then they realized that, you know, India had such an advanced culture in the past, which we do not, do not have also in Europe. And then, you know, it was very difficult for them to justify, you know, their early statement. But then they said, okay, okay, India has a, you know, very advanced civilization, but the people who who built the civilization, they were Europeans, they came from West. So that is how, you know, they, they, they fostered the idea of superior Aryan race. And that continued even after British rule, even after 
1947, the same maybe concept, same hypothesis was continued by many Indian scholars until today. This was a vexing point in our Indian history. But now, of course, I do, I consider this as a no more uh, issue in Indian history. So the theories that were made about you know maybe about Aryans from where they came, what is the date of the Aryans. So there, you know, it varies from person to person, from scholar to scholar. But most of the theories put forth earlier, they were based on mere speculation. For example, you know, uh, Lokmani Tilak thought that the Aryans came from the from extreme uh, polar region and around maybe six six thousand BCE. So many scholars, you know, put this uh, Aryan invasion or migration between 6000 to 1500 bc that is the range you know in which most of the scholars try to fit the aryan invasion or aryan migration then you know most of the scholars also believe that maybe around 1500 bc the aryans came to indian subcontinent because you know there was a one inscription found at turkey at a, at a place called bugaskoi now that inscription dated to 14th century BC that you know mentions about the treaty between Hittites and Mitannis and there in fact in the treaty it was mentioned the Vaitya gods like Indra, Varun, Agni were mentioned and they scholars thought that you know, these are the Vaitya gods you know, which originated maybe in that part and later when the people started moving into Indian subcontinent they brought this you know into Indian subcontinent and that is how the Aryans the Aryans, you know, you know, they became the Rigvedic Aryans, and these people came in India and they they composed the you know Rigvedic texts in Indian subcontinent or Vedic texts in Indian subcontinent. That is the hypothesis made by most of the scholars. So Wheeler's in fact misinterpretation of data from the site of Mohenjo-daro is very interesting. Now Wheeler also of the strong opinion that the Harappans were Dravidians and the Aryans came from outside and they killed, they invaded India and they destroyed the, the most important Harappan city, that is the city of Mohanjadaro. And he showed this evidence. Uh, he found there were some skeletal remains found in the upper street at Mohanjadaro. And this, this particular data was treated by him as the data of the people killed by the Aryans in so-called Aryans coming from outside. But let me tell you that, you know, this particular sculpture remains were scientifically examined by one famous physical anthropologist, Kenneth Kennedy. And Kennedy clearly mentioned that these people did not die in any skirmishes or any maybe, you know, fight, but they probably died because of suffocation or because of some pandemic. The suffocation state is strong because these cultural remains were found in the flood deposit. And the site of Mohanjadaro, where this remain, the remains were found, that site was right on the bank of River Indus. And River Indus has a history of frequent flooding. During Harappan times, you know, two, you know, two floods occur, you know, when the Harappan civilization was, you know, very strong, you know, economically. But the last flood occurred maybe when the decline started, maybe around 2000-1900 BC. And that time maybe a lot of people must have died in that flood. And these are the skeleton remains, in fact, which were discovered by the archaeologists there. So it is quite clear that you know these people were not killed in any war or skirmishes at all. So they were not killed by anyone. So as far as the people are concerned, we are more concerned about, you know, who are the people? We cannot say much about, you know, people of this Stone Age people period. Up to the beginning of settled life, we have no idea about who were the people in, in Indian subcontinent. The general hypothesis theory is that, you know, people came from, from African continent and they spread this, this, you know, dispersed in different parts of the world and they, those people came to Indian subcontinent. But as you know, we are getting you know, uh, older and older dates for the beginning of Paleolithic or the Stone Age in Indian subcontinent, perhaps 
this theory also is we will find you know maybe backstage one one day but from maybe 2 million to almost 12000 years we have no idea to know who were the people but from the beginning of settled life certainly you know, now we have idea who are the you know who are the people who develop agriculture here who develop first urbanization and you know who continued the cultural continuity in the indian subcontinent so we know about these people now earlier it was thought that the agriculture happened in west asia and then people started moving to other parts of the world but that is not true now it is quite clear that uh, the development of agriculture the domestication plant and animal the settled life was happening independently in different regions in india it was happen ha happening independently in mesopotamia in egypt in china that was happening independently and right from the beginning of settled life of course you know there was maybe long distance trade long distance contact and right from the beginning of settled life the mixing was happening that is quite clear in both the archaeological data as well as genetic data also so this is the region you know which is showing the you know harappan region much bigger compared to this small you know mesopotamian and egyptian you know here on this side but these were the you know those civilizations the sumerian akkadian civilization in mesopotamia which was contemporary to the harappan civilization here and the egyptian civilization here on this side they were contemporary so these three civilizations were contemporary and apart from that there were two regions called dilmun and magan there were also you know baby cultures here and they also had very strong connection with harappan culture with mesopotamian and beyond also so this is the region of the harappans i just want to show we have discovered so far 2000 harappan sites out of which there are five harappan cities there are only five harappan cities the general misconception about the people is that every harappan city harappan settlement or site is a harappan city that, that is not true there were only five cities there may be one dozen maximum one dozen harappan towns and the rest were maybe harappan maybe uh, agriculture villages small and big there were manufacturing centers there were harappan ports and even small temporary settlements which were established for the exploitation of raw material so that is the kind of evidence we get in the in the harappan level now before the research is uh, at rakhigadi which we started in 2010 11 it was thought that mohenjodaro is the biggest harappan city followed by harappa then rakhigadi then dholavira and finally ganveriwala now you know the research that we conducted now we know that rakhigadi has almost the area which is double the size of almost mohenjodaro so rakhigadi is the biggest urban city now followed by mohenjodaro harappa dholavira and ganveriwala we do not know much about ganveriwala because that site is not yet excavated but all other four cities i call them as you know harappan cosmopolitan cities uh, which have been excavated uh, there is a mention, of course, about River Saraswati in the Rigvedic text. I will not go into detail, but we have almost established now that the present Gagar, uh, which flows uh, from the foothills of Siwalix uh, into Punjab, then almost you know, crisscrossing the entire Haryana, parts of Rajasthan, and then enters into Pakistan and in Bahawalpur, distinct Pakistan. And from there, it goes down straight and meets the sea uh, in the uh, Gulf of Kutch somewhere. So this entire re you know, river, in India, this river is called Gagar. And in Pakistan, this same river is called Hakra. So Gagar and Hakra was the ancient river Saraswati, scientifically established not only by archaeologists, geologists, hydrologists, but also by the space scientists. They have you know, analyzed the imagery uh, photograph and they have traced the entire course dried course of river saraswati identification of river saraswati was done right from maybe 16th century 
this is the earliest map prepared during the british uh, during the mogul rule and this map was prepared by dutch cartographer then these are the you know imagery you know the photographs uh, you know analyzed by isro now here you can see that it the river originates it was not only one river there was network of rivers but then there, there was a major river which is called saraswati uh, in the rigvedic text and there is a mention of of river drushadwati also so the drushadwati is also quite you know clear uh, in you know in this you know, here it is here uh, so saras saraswati and drushadwati uh, these were the important rivers and you can see the distribution of the sites the major concentration of the harappan sites nearly two third of the harappan settlements they were located in the saraswati basin that indicates how important significant this river was during the harappan times and because of that we find heavy concentration of the sites in this region now the site of uh, you know uh, this uh, mehergarh now that site has given us you know first clue about the beginning of settled life and the settled life which you know maybe coincides you know co terminates with the with the settled life in west asia in mesopotamia in egypt in china etc and here you know one can see the constant development from the beginning of settled life from the beginning of domestication of plant and animal there is a gradual change transformation and that transformation has ultimately culminated into formation of the harappan culture at one stage and the harappan culture has transformed into harappan civilization in the middle of the 3rd millennium bc so that entire history is quite clear uh, at this particular site then you know i will come to the site of rakigadi uh, here you can see you know the uh, different localities uh, which have which have been identified by the archaeological survey of india and the archaeological survey of india when they prepared this map they also have shown the dried course of river drushadwati and uh, drushadwati was one of the major tributaries of saraswati and the largest harappan city was located in the drushadwati valley the saraswati drushadwati valley is really very 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 fertile but have the most fertile units in the world and therefore you no know, people have prefer this area this is the map prepared by us you can see that you know that you know the site was spread one of very large area all the gray portion that you see here that is a part of the site but today that part of the site is destroyed and it is under the modern occupation but then you know this uh, reddish portion that you see here that is the portion which is still plot, you know properly intact still you know not disturbed and quite intact and protected by the archaeological survey of india so the total area that we have calculated is around 550 hectare out of which nearly 500 hectare has been destroyed people have removed this you know the the site portion the habitation portion and they have converted that area into agricultural fields today but thanks to asi that you know the portion which is intact that has been protected by the archaeological survey of india in this drone photograph you can see you know this total these are the this is a part of the site huge area which is you know not visible now which is almost you know, maybe the traces are there only the site has gone but you can see nearly 5000 people are living uh, uh, you know here on this mound in fact and see the area which is intact this is the part which is protected by the archaeological survey of india so this has become a national monument now and here you know we undertook uh, uh, in the exercise in the excavation which was aimed first to understand the history of the site and here you know in this particular section it looks small in picture it is almost 24 meter thick deposit perhaps the thickest deposit at any archaeological site in the country so in the lower part maybe in the lower 4 meter we have the early harappan deposit which is dated from 5500 bc to 2600 bc and the remaining upper part is the 
deposit of the Harappan civilization phase, or we call this as the mature Harappan phase from 2600 BC to 1900 BC. And here, in fact, in this particular section, we could identify the transformation, the transition from a very small rural Harappan settlement to the cosmopolitan city at this particular site. So that journey you know, could be identified at this particular site. And here you can see that in the, you know, in the lowermost levels, we have the you know, small circular pit dwellings, followed by you know, maybe uh, circular structures, circular huts on the surface. In the third phase, you know, we find rectangular structures. Now you know, they have started producing the bricks in proper ratio, one is to two is to three and one is to two is to four. In the fourth stage, you know, they have introduced modicum of planning. It became a proper, you know, linear settlement. And in the fifth stage, it becomes a full-fledged settlement, full-fledged city. So these are some of the features found in the early levels. These are the pit dwellings. I will not explain them in great detail, but we identified that they must pit dwelling because inside the pit, you know, we found the fireplace and the remains indicating the dwelling part there. In the second stage, these type of, you know, overground circular structures came into existence. So there is a proper evidence of the gradual evolution. The city has not come into existence suddenly. There's a long precedence. And that precedence is found. We have the evidence of that precedence now. So these, this is the structure of the second phase. In the third stage, you know, now you can see a proper rectangular structure with, uh, you know, the the walls are made of bricks, mud bricks here, of course. And of course, they also produce burnt bricks for, for bathing platforms, also for toilets. Also, the concept of tandoor comes into existence. In the next stage, in the fourth stage, now you can see a modicum of planning. You know, the houses are, you know, aligned, you know, the main streets on both sides. So concept of street, Big street, small street, structures on either side. That comes concept comes into existence, and then finally, this is the full-fledged city that emerges at one stage. This is the picture from the site of Mohenjo, of course, but this is the story of the development of the Harappan urbanization, Harappan city, how the cities have evolved from a very modest beginning. So we have very strong evidence. So same people have continued the activities generation after generation, and the people, same people are responsible for the development of cities and towns in Indian subcontinent. Now, similar transformation also is visible in the material culture, particularly in pottery. This is the kind of pottery that we find in the early phase, in the, the pottery from the earliest phase of the Harappan culture. It is coarse, handmade, not you know, painted, very little decoration, but very simple pottery. In the second stage, of course, pottery becomes, you know, slightly there's a transformation. Now the pottery is better fired. They've used, you know, better clay now, better raw material for making pottery. And in the next stage, of course, it becomes a classical pottery. So we have a very strong evidence about the transition from, you know, very simple beginning to, you know, very, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, advanced stage. So we can see the transition in the typological aspect, in the technological aspect, and finally the become the pottery becomes, you know, classical in the, uh, you know, in the middle of the third millennium BC. So this is a transition which is quite clear in the material culture also. Now the method that we adopted, then I am moving towards you know the uh, most important part of our research, that is the you know the archaeogenetic research or the DNA research, ancient DNA research that we began at the site of uh, Rakigiri. Now, the picture that you are seeing here is the picture from Farmana. The mistake which we did, we did not take precaution while excavating the barriers because, you know, we realized that you now our DNA can get into ancient DNA easily and that needs to be prevented. Now, now you know, the DNA science, science has advanced so much now it is possible to distinguish between ancient and modern DNA. 
But when we began this research in 2008-9, that time this particular technique was not developed. So that time it was suggested that you now we should take proper precaution, which we had not because we had no idea, in fact, how to, you know, go for go about for this research. The second mistake we did was we excavated all the barriers, nearly 75 barriers at one and the same time. We kept them open. The third mistake which we did was we kept them open for long, almost for two months. Our intention was good. We wanted people to come and see so that, you know, whatever misunderstanding they have, you know, that can be dispelled. So that is our, our, our intention. But finally, when we tried to extract DNA, we completely miserably failed because whatever DNA was survived there, that must have gone because these barriers were open, you know, to the vagaries of, you know, climate for almost two months. So maybe, you know, because of sun, because of the rain, you know, there was a lot of, you know, contamination happening here. So this mistake was realized by us after we had discussion with many uh, scholars from outside. And then we began our research at, uh, you know, in the cemetery at Rakigiri. The cemetery is roughly one kilometer away from the habitation site. The Harappans had separate graveyard. And uh, you can see here, in fact, you know, the area that we you know, this is the area which was excavated by Archaeological Survey of India earlier, but then remaining portion was excavated by us, and we excavated nearly 60 burials here. Uh, before the, you know, actual the work was started, and then, you know, initial preparation, then, you know, you know, we are very close to the excavation of the burial, and then we started excavation of the burial. But then, you know, we decided to, to take precaution here. Now, the picture you, which you see here, this is not the picture of the Corona warrior, but this is the picture of the burial warrior. So we use, you know, head, you know, head cap, goggle, mask, disposal gown, disposal gloves. And, you know, we also use, you know, separate uh, excursion tools for separate burials. The same tools were not repeated for the other burials to make to make sure that you know, there is no contamination. By using this, by taking this precaution, this is the new methodology of excavation that we have introduced now in India. And we are suggesting, we are advo advocating that those who are excavating burials, ancient burials, they should take you know, precaution like this. Whether the intention is to extract DNA or not, that is not important. But we should take as much precaution as possible for prevention of any kind of contamination in the ancient burial samples. And then, of course, you know, this, you know, this is how the, you know, the excursion happened. You know, all of us, me, my students, all the teachers who participated, they all participated in the excursion. And this is the delicate work that we ourselves have done this work by taking this type of precaution. So, you know, we followed this, you know, we made sure that, you know, there is no contamination and this is how the burials were excavated. It is a very, you know, tedious and long process. It is not easy to excavate one burial, you know, it takes, you know, 10 to 15 days. It is not that, that easy. But this is how, you know, we followed. These are some of the remains that we excavated. One double burial here. Double burials are not very common, but we do find some burials. Now, in this case, of course, you know, I, 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 we have written a paper on this, on this double burial. There's a male and female here. And uh, maybe male is around 25 years, female is around 22, 23 years old. And both of them die, died simultaneously. There are no injury marks. Perhaps they, they died because of some maybe heart attack or some, you know, maybe something like that disease simultaneously. And they were buried in a, common symmetry with same maybe you know uh, rituals as they followed for other burials so that means you now the relationship of these two was was uh, legal perhaps you know they were either husband and wife or they were brother and sister and therefore you know they found a place in a common symmetry if they had some kind of illicit relationship perhaps you know their burial would have been somewhere else and they could not have given the same treatment as they did for the other burials so we have written about this. So my hypothesis that perhaps you know, the concept of marriage also probably you know, began during the Harappan times. 
because harappans introduced number of traditions number of basic sciences and technologies and most of them have continued till today and we are following that even today so this concept also may have been introduced by the harappans and it continued uh from the barriers of course you know, we can make our relatively the status of the person where is social status and economic status some on the basis of the number of goods some barriers have maybe one or two pots some barriers have you know, maybe 40 50 pots so that reflects you know the social and economic status of the person so this data is very very important for us and then of course you know, we also did lot of sampling after the barriers are excavated we did the sampling and one sampling that you now we did one uh, you know aspect that we wanted to understand whether we can get the parasite eggs from the harappan you know bodies particularly from the uh, lower portion the portion near abdomen and the hip portion because you know the koreans uh, who were collaborating with us they have successfully extracted the you know extracted parasite eggs from the ancient remains in korea and they analyzed this parasite eggs and they could identify the dna of the person from the basis of uh, this parasite eggs so we were also we wanted to collect as much data as possible so we also were interested in that and uh, you know that uh, in our body in you know in all of us in our body we have the parasite eggs it happens because of maybe sometimes contaminated food or water and when the you know that you know we die the body disintegrates but the parasite eggs survive and they can survive for thousands of years so that we, we wanted to find whether we can, we are getting those parasite eggs but unfortunately we are not found that evidence here then you know this you know packing was done what we did in fact you know the mistake which we did at you know at farmana was avoided we con we used to concentrate one burial at a time we used to bur you know excavate that burial immediately we used to document that burial and then after that we used to you know remove the bones we used to pack the bones and send the samples to our, to our lab in deccan college so this is what was done uh, at the site and once you know it was brought to the laboratory then you know we also need to clean these bones uh, for you know prepare these bones for the sampling so we our students you know they clean these bones by taking the same precaution making sure that there is no contamination even in the lab also and then you know the process that we followed was very simple this is how you know the bones were brought uh, to the laboratory samples then we did the anthropological examination you know we tried to you know we identify you now the you know maybe age sex of the person height everything you know you know that was you know done we also done ct scanning that that ct scan data is required for cranial facial re, you know reconstruction then also you know paleo parasitology we tried but we failed there and then we did the sampling for two uh, purposes one for dna extraction ancient dna and this set of samples also also was prepared to understand the food habit of people the percentage of plant food animal food you know what 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 was the food habit of the people the general maybe you know health and diet of the people for that you know we undertook this type of different scientific analysis there are stabilized sort of analysis starch grain analysis residue analysis lipid profile analysis trontium analysis etc so i won't explain them in great detail but you know from that one can find out what kind of food these people have eaten and what was the status of the health of the person so this was done in fact so the condition you know in indian subcontinent is not ideal for the preservation of dna we had almost failed at rakhigadi also out of 70 burials 62 burials we excavated here we you know we analyze all the burials in case of 61 we almost found nil and we thought that perhaps you know we will not be able to succeed we will not be able to get dna and we were you know about to about our you know our efforts but then this lady this is the skeletal remain of a lady so the lady came to our rescue 
we had this lady luck here in this lady we found a strong dna very very authentic harappan dna in this lady so this lady was quite beautiful because she has very sharp features and probably she is from very affluent family because you can see the amount of pottery around so probably her status was quite high in the society so we found this burial and we extracted dna from this so this was a you know major major breakthrough in this research it is very very difficult to get dna in this you know condition because the climatic condition is not conducive it is more humid and uh, the the soil is more acidic which is not good for the preservation but we were fortunate it is like tutankhamen's you know tomb the discovery of tutankhamen tomb was made you know when they were about to you know discard the excavation there on the last day they found similarly you know, we also found this you know in the last sample and then of course the samples as i mentioned that you know firstly you know this entire procedure was done research procedure was done in india we cleaned the samples we took the samples to ccmb in hyderabad we extracting dna there you know we also did the sampling of this uh, you know dna analysis also we did the se sequencing of the dna also you know we interpreted the data but then as i mentioned that we wanted to get some cross checking from outside india and that cross checking happened in fact you know from harvard university and also from seoul national university and then after we got the results from all they were all you know on the equal footing in fact you know uh, they were you know same as you know as what we had and after that you know we published this paper and the title of the paper itself suggests an ancient harappan genome lacks ancestry from steppe pastoralist or iranian farmers so the title itself is very clear that the ancestry of south asia was very very distinct and then you know we did further research now you know in india of course you know there were some people not professional but non professional particularly the you know reporters and you know those who who consider themselves as scientists or archaeologists they only started criticism criticizing but no professional has criticized our research but at the same time there's a one a very big international conference on genomics is a big organization and every year they identify some breakthrough researches in, in genomics and they identified in 2019 nine breakthrough researches in in omics science or genomics and rakigadi was on top of that so this is the recognition that you know the international scientific community has given to us so the research that we did was was extremely scientific this is the only way by which we understand who are the people the dna is the ultimate science by which we can understand about the people and that exactly what we did in fact so what happens in fact maybe around 10000 bc you know the hunter gatherers somewhere maybe on the border of maybe afghanistan iran or maybe more towards you know, maybe uh, northwest of indian subcontinent the hunter gatherers they split into two groups one group came to south asia this is the group which came to south asia and one group went to to iran the group which went to, went to iran they got mixed up with the anatolian farmers there the, the mixing was happening there but the group which came to south asia now they were developing their own ancestry and they distinctly developed their own ancestry here so this is a distinct ancestry which got developed in south asia and we do not find any trace of the iranian farmers in this nor any trace of the steppe steppe you know maybe uh, pastorals in this so this is a pure ancestry and this ancestry we started developing around 10000 bc that continues into the harappan ancestry the harappan also you know carry the same ancestry and from harappan till modern times till today the ancestry continues and most of us carry the harappan ancestry even today so there is a continuity in this genetic history also for last 10000 years we have seen the continuity in the archaeological data from the beginning of harappan culture to the end of the harappan culture and even after the end of the harappan culture also there is a continuity in the indian subcontinent and uh, you know the same continuity is also found 
in the genetic history also of south asians see right from the beginning of course as i mentioned that you know the mixing was happening but the mixing from different parts people were coming you know they were interacting and they were also maybe you know uh, getting you know mixed up with each other so some mixing was happening but the dominant gene is that of a south asian south asian it it does not have any name but we call this as a south asian ancestry so we are maybe you know 2% maybe ancestry from west 2% you know 3% ancestry from iran maybe 4% from steppe like that there is a mixing happening and that mixing is because of the trade right from the early stage you know these people started trading with different regions and they came in contact with different regions so rakigri samples you know we were you know we found out that the harappans were not carrying any genetic signature from iranian related ancestry this is extremely fascinating and indicative that agriculture in south asia was invented and practiced by indigenous population this sets aside the previous belief that farming was brought by neolithic farmers so, so that keeps it outside the second very interesting <coughs> evidence that we have from this research is that that significant movement of harappans was towards central asia for the first time we are reporting out of india theory on the basis of the presence of harappan like ancestry in turkmenistan and iranian population contemporary to the harappan civilization this discovery has potential to start claiming about out of india theory so it is not that no the so called aryans came from outside but it is the harappans who began to go out first and then of course there is a reciprocal movement happen in the you know in indian subcontinent now what we did in fact now we analyzed the samples from the site called sari sari sokta in iran and the site called called gonur in turkmenistan so both the sites were excavated by local archaeologist and both the sites were contemporary to the harappans and at both the sites they found lot of harappan objects indicating contact with the harappans so there also you know they used to bury the dead bodies so we extracted dna from you know the remains uh, from gonur and also from shari sokta and what we found to our surprise we found the mixing of harappan gene in the in their population at both the places at gonur as well as in shari sokta but their genes were not present in the harappan population at at rakigadi so that means you know the harappans first went there to shari sokta gonur to that region and later you know those people started reciprocate reciprocating they started moving in fact towards indian subcontinent so that is how you know that you know the movement started and once they realized that you know they can also go to indian subcontinent the people from steppe and maybe iran then you know the movement you know started you know increasing so we find maybe more contact after 2000 bc that that only indicates more contact that's all so this is very very important so if at all those anybody believes that they you know there was a aryan the concept was there suppose somebody believes then i can say that the aryans were indians only and they probably you know started going out first and then you know outside people kept started coming in so genetically you know steppe ingression in south asia has not happened until 1000 bc after 1000 bc you now we find more more and more people coming here but that is not any migration or invasion at all so there is a, there was a mixing but you know the gradual mixing was happening and you know here in patna you know, we you know we can see the mixing how the mixing was happening from indian subcontinent towards steppe towards iranian region and how much percentage was you know of the mixing was taking place so that is all clear in fact in our research and then of course you know we also you know did the uh, reconstruct the people of uh, harappan civilization the genome from harappan civilization is from a population that is the largest source for south asian south asians most of the south asians they carry the harappan genes even today the population has no detectable ancestry from steppe pastoralists or from anatolians or iranian farmer, farmers suggesting farmer you know, farming in south asia arose from local foragers 
rather than from large scale migration from waste so this is a very very important you know uh, conclusions that we could draw from this particular research and we why we say that you know most of the south asians you know they carry the harappan genes mainly because you know we have analyzed the dna of the modern population uh, from all over south asia we have selected some from indo european language group we are also from you know dravidian language group we also have some samples from the austro asiatic language group the tibeto burmanese language group etc and there are also some you know linguistic isolate you know isolate groups also so we chose the samples we took the samples from all of them nearly 140 different groups were represented in our samples more than 2500 samples were were studied and you know the dna was extracted from them and the, then it was studied and there we found that you know most of the people have dominant harappan gene and then of course there is a lot of mixing of course from different regions but when we have dominant harappan genes that means we are the descendants from that particular you know maybe gene that means you know most of us are descendants of the harappans we selected you know groups of different religious you know religions different caste and creed and in all from bengal to afghanistan and from kashmir to andaman nicobar we found you know the you know harappan genes present in all the population so we are all you know descendants of the harappan that is quite clear now from this particular research and then of course you know then then movement the harappan how the entire subcontinent was brought under the harappan you know ancestry the ancestry developed somewhere in northwest then you know we have the you know second oldest evidence of the origin of agriculture or the beginning of agriculture of 6500 bc in the mid ganga basin you know maybe you know people harap you know these people started moving toward this part got mixed up with the local people here some people also started moving toward, towards the mewar region around 4500 bc they got mixed up here and then in rest of the country between 2000 and 2500 bc that is how the entire you know, south asia was brought under the harappan ancestry so this is very 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 clear and that is also clear in the archaeological data this is the you know harappan region here and you know we have this you know maybe the ahar culture here you know the kaitha malwa culture in central india the deccan region has jorbe malwa culture etc so there you know we find you know gradually you know the you know ancestry harappan ancestry you know traveling to this regions so the harappan ancestry harappan influence cultural influence also started moving along with this ancestry and probably the harappan language also may have started you know moving around this we do not know much about this about the language of the people of course at this stage so harappans were not the only people living you know in india that time you know there were number of contemporary populations we call them as neolithic or chalkolithic farmers who were contemporary to the harappans and the harappans and the contemporary neolithic chalkolithic farmers they had very very strong interaction because harappans used to get raw materials from these chalkolithic neolithic communities and in return the harappans used to supply them finished goods so they had very cordial relationship so you know because of that you know a lot of mixing must have happened and that is how the harappan ancestry harappan cultural influence began to spread on a very large area so we have this indo european population austro asiatic dravidian andamanese tibeto burman so in this four at least you know we have we don't know much at this stage you know about this because you know the, you know we need to work on this you know on on the samples from this region but all of these of different linguistic groups they have the common ancestry that is what is revealed you know from our research then you will wonder it you know, why do we have such a such a maybe complexion different complexion you know various you know maybe facial features various appearances in india or in south asia perhaps south asia has the has the highest you know amount of uh, this uh, complexion in the world and this complexion has nothing to do with the genetic history but it has to do with the geography of the region in which people are living maybe the food habit of the people in which they are living the climatic condition 
and the you know mixing from where you know, mix, the more mixing is happening and depending on that the complexions are are, are determined so in south india you now we have different complexion because you know we have more maybe you know uh, african you know maybe you know mixing whereas in north india we have more maybe iranian and maybe you know this uh, central asian mixing because of that people look slightly different but all of them have common ancestry which is very very important and the last research that we did you know which is very very important for the first time this is also for the first time the dna research is for the first time and let me tell you that you know the research on harappan culture started exactly 100 years ago and 100 years ago it was considered to be the breakthrough in you know, our important discovery in the world because you know it uh, you know it changed the perspective of indian history and exactly after you know after 100 years we have made this you know important breakthrough about the harappan people who are the harappan people so that was the one important research and at the same time we had initiated this cranio facial or the 3d reconstruction of the harappan people so that research was carried out and for which you know we need you know this type of complete data we need this type of complete data and then only you know it is possible to reconstruct the you know features so we have you know we have reconstructed you know this is a harappan maybe you know 18 or 19 year boy or ma man uh, maybe around 6 feet tall you know very handsome tall boy so we have reconstructed this you know the facial feature of this boy and also we have this harappan woman maybe around 45 years old woman so her skeletal remains also were quite intact so we have reconstructed the facial feature of this woman also but for facial feature you know we need two important sets of data one is the matrix data the measurements of the bone of the, all the bones you know which we took sometimes or you know uh, while excavating and sometimes you now after the excavation also you know we could take when we did the anthropological examination we have created all the matrix data so that data is available and also we did the you know we need the inner anatomical data also so that data could be obtained by undertaking the ct scanning of the skeletal remains so we did that for most of the intact skeletal remains and then of course the data that we generated that was fed in the computer and step by step you know it started recreating the facial features of the person so initially you know this uh, the the face the broken portion of the skull was mended it was properly you know, re you know recreated reconstructed in three stages and in the next stage of course you know this flesh and blood you know were were put on the on the skeletal remains and finally the skin and uh, the reconstruction that this is how the harappan boy looked like this is the initial stage of the facial feature and this is so expensive that you know we need a lot of funding you know if you have to go to the next stage to show maybe the color of the hair the color of the eyes color of the skin then you know it is still more expensive but at this stage at least we know that you know the harappan people and the modern people they look alike so there is a continuity in the complexion of the you know people also in the appearance from harappan till the modern time so this boy looks exactly like the, the harappan boy and here also you can see the harappan woman and the modern woman they look alike and the you know the modern look woman looks exactly like harappan woman so there is a continuity in this also so in all the three datas evidences that i i discussed briefly the archaeological data where we can see the continuity and you know there's a transformation from maybe one generation to another generation that is quite clear transformation in their technology in their material culture that is quite clear then in the genetic history also for last 10000 years there is no change in the genetic history suppose you know as per you know the hypothesis of some people that the aryans came from outside and they invaded india then two things would have happened they could have you know they could have introduced a new genetic history in south asia the genetic history of south asian would have been broken at some stage which has not broken and there is a continuity so there there is no introduction of new genetic history in south asia till today even though you know at later stage you know a lot of people you know a lot of you know 
these invaders came to South Asia, you know, to India, the Huns came, Kushans came, you know, Mughals came, you know, in large number, and even Britishers came here, but, you know, they could not, you know, break our ancestry. The Indians, you know, they absorbed these people in the society. That is the picture, you know, we, you know, we get. So that thing would have happened, but it has, it has not happened. And the second thing would have happened that, you know, when people come from different regions, you know, new region, they could have brought with them the cultural elements, which has not happened again. When Indians go to America or Europe, settle down there, still, you know, we can make out the houses of Indians because a lot of cultural elements are still preserved in their, in their houses. So that type of situation is not found anywhere in the last 10,000 years. And therefore, you know, we can completely rule out the Aryan invasion or migration theory. We always believe that there was a movement of the people and that movement is happening right from the beginning of settled life for the last 10,000 years. It is not the movement of the Harappans or the later people. So that is the kind of you know, evidence we find. And finally, you know, if we had to analyze the data and you know, we had to you know, reach to the broad conclusions. So now, you know, we can say neither early Irani farmers nor steppies have contributed to the making of the South Asian ancestry. No change or breakage in the ancestry of major South Asian population for last 12,000 years, implying neither large scale migration nor invasion of the so-called Aryans from outside South Asia. Then different human complexions develop in South Asia due to factors like geography, climate, food habits, etc. Genome has no role to play in this respect. Most of the developments, such as domestication, settled way of life, village life, city life, etc. Now that was authored by the indigenous people. Then we have new light on the Aryan invasion theory and Vedic people and culture. Sometimes I will talk about the Vedic people and the culture later. But certainly you know, we have some new evidence now, new direction in this respect. Most of the South Asians are the descendants of the Harappans and probably there is a continuity in appearances also. Uh, also, I have a, you know, this is the research I'm working on. Possibly Harappans spoke Indo, Proto-Indo-European language, that is Sanskrit. I'm working on that. And, uh, you know, I have spoken about the out of India movement, etc. So this is the, you know, the broad conclusions that we can draw from the research that we have done and broadly speaking you know that you know we can certainly say that you know that this new research has tremendous implication on the history of south asia now most of the you know earlier maybe uh, mistakes can be corrected now i don't say that we can we can write re rewrite history but we can always correct the history as and when we get new evidence we can always keep on correcting Suppose, you know, after some time, somebody generates some new evidence, perhaps, you know, our hypothesis, our conclusion may, may change. We do not know. But at this stage, this is the, you know, this is the, you know, the implication of the research that we have done. But, you know, we are planning now in Python on large scale research. We want to have more samples from Rakhigadi itself because in Rakhigadi itself, there, there may have been different, you know, groups about which we do not have any idea. The composition of population is not clear even at Rakigari. And the Harappans had occupied different ecological zones. They were there in Sin, Baluchistan, in, uh, in Gujarat, Kutch area of Gujarat, also in Rajasthan, Punjab, and Haryana. So we need to get data from all these. Plus, you know, we have to have data from outside the Harappan region also to find out the relation between Harappans and the contemporary population. And also, we are interested in knowing you know, the continuity of the genes from Harappan till present time. And therefore, you know, I am in CCMB now in fact, to develop the national facility for ancient DNA research so that you know, we can do this research on a very large scale. And uh, unless we have more data and unless we pursue this type of research, we perhaps we will not be able to make breakthrough research in our Indian history. And that is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to take some questions if you have any. Thank you so much, sir. We sure to have questions in the chat box right now. And if anybody else needs to ask something, they can unmute themselves and then they can ask. But before we go ahead, there is one question. 
asked by uh, Mr. Pradeep. Uh, he has two questions actually. First question is, did the speaker preserve the genes collected and replicated them? Sorry? Uh, his first question is, did the speaker preserve the genes collected and replicated them? No, we cannot really say much about that at, at this stage. We do not know much about that. And his second question is, uh, do you find any animal skeletons in Rakhigadi site? No, we do not have skeletal remains, but we have a lot of bones. These are the full refuse, uh, which, you know, which were thrown in the garbage. So we have collected a lot of animal bones. And also, you know, we are simultaneously working on the DNA of the animals also. And also, you know, at some stage, you now we will be also developing the facility for DNA of the plants also in India. So that is in pipeline. So we need to have this type of data, but we do not have skeletal data, but we have a lot of bones, animal bones. And uh, we have that data available for this type of research also. So uh, Ms. Vaishnavi has asked, uh, where can we find the report of this Rakhi Gadi excavation? Uh, report, uh, you know, we have published a few papers, but you know the final report is coming out now. We are in the final stage. Maybe next six months it will be available for the you know public now. But we have published a number of research papers in uh, prestigious journals. So the research papers are available. So those who are interested, you know, they can write to me. We can send the PDF of the researches that we have done. Certainly. Okay. Shreshi uh, Ray has raised their hands. Uh, yes, you can go ahead, Shreshi. If there is any question. No? Okay, moving ahead. Uh, Ms. Chitra has asked, what is your view on the existence of horses in South Asia? No, we have, you know, a lot of fossils, of course, you know, fossils, you know, what happens when the animals are buried uh, under the uh, geological deposit, then, you know, the, of course, you know, the flesh and, the, you know, other things, you know, disappear, but the bones, you know, they remain. And after 10,000 years, you know, the bones, you know, start getting hardened and then, you know, they start getting, you know, fossilized. So that, you know, that evidence is there, in fact, you know, in many parts of the, you know, in particularly in the river basins, river, you know, maybe, you know, river uh, assuries, we do have a lot of these fossil remains. In every river along the river banks or maybe, you know, uh, the mouth of the river, we do have these uh, remains. So the uh, remains are very old, maybe you know, 80,000 years old, some are 40,000 years old. So we have a lot of this collection of fossils and the paleontologists are working on uh, this aspect also. Okay, Professor Amita Pandey has raised her hands. Uh, sir, if you need to ask anything, you can go ahead. Uh, good evening, Professor Shinde Amita here. Good, good evening, good evening. Nice to see you. I uh, just, uh, yeah, it was wonderful presentation. I would like to just know, uh, any comparison you have done with the genes from Rakhi Gadi and Andamanis because that's an again an isolated population in India. Yes, yes, the, the Andamanis they are the you know, true you know the indigenous people, and they have preserved this you know this uh, Harappan ancestry very well. So Andamanis you know they also have the Harappan ancestry. There is not much mixing happening in the you know in Andamanis population, and therefore you know we you know we don't see any change in them. But in other parts, of course, you know, a lot of mixing has happened. And because of that, you know, the Harappan ancestry, Harappan genes, you know, they have diluted, in fact, in other parts. But they have remained permanently you know, and well preserved, in fact, in the Andamanis. So we call them as the real, true, you know, indigenous people of the country. Without any, you know, maybe mixing or any kind of uh, maybe influence from outside world. Thank you. Pleasure. So there is one more question uh, by Mr. Sanjoy Kumar. Uh, he is asking, uh, what is the cultural impression of Rakhi Gadi like? Is it similar to Harappa and Mohajandaru? Yeah, exactly. It is a part of the Harappan culture only. We have the same material culture as found at Harappa and Mohajandaru. There are, as I mentioned, that there are 2,000 settlements 
where you find the similar harappan pottery harappan material culture and therefore we call that them as the harappan you know settlements so rakigadi also is a part of the harappan city one of the harappan cities and it is exactly like harappan mohenjo maybe the the planning may be different but material culture is exactly same as harappan mohenjo Uh, Mr. Yash has asked, uh, in which time frame did the Saraswati River dry up? The exactly around maybe 1900 BC. We do not have date, but I can say, on the basis of archaeological data, we have mapped the sites found in that region, and we found that you know the early Harappan sites from 5500 to 2600 BC, and the mature Harappan sites from 2600 BC to 1900 BC. they are found located along the river banks but after 1900 bc the, the sites are going away from the river banks that means the river has started losing its significance and therefore you know people are going away that means the river has started drying up that time so that is the you know clue that we have we do not have absolute dates for the drying up but this is a very strong clue that we can use archaeological data we can use for understanding the event Mr. Anirudh is asking if Aryan invasion not happened, then how Rigveda was written? If Harappan, the, the Rigvedas were written by the Harappans only. I can give us a special lecture on that. You know how there is a similarity between Harappans and the Rigveda. So, uh, there is one more. So, Mr. J ha has asked, like, if there was any genetic link between Harappan Rakhi Gadi people with Mesopotamian people. Ah, uh, not we we are not worked on that yet. I think our next next stage is that you know, we will collaborate with some scholars from Mesopotamia and also from Egypt, and uh, to find out whether you know we can we find any kind of mixing of you know between Harappans and the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians that we need to find out. But at this stage, now this the research has not really gone beyond that limit. Okay. So, if anyone else needs to ask, they can unmute themselves and then. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, have, uh, very fascinating to hear you. Although I have been hearing a lot about Rakhigari, but I have not studied or read about it yet. But it's uh, great to like uh, hear from you itself. And uh, uh, I have one question. Like yes. uh, you said, the uh, the comparison is from from Bengal to this Gujarat. Is the yes. not eastern part is not included in the uh, samples from the north eastern part is not being included in the comparison of genome or the... no no we yes. we did include of course not we have not left the, you know that part at all we have included okay. the samples okay. from that but we do not find the harappan genes present in the north east population at this right, right 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 so probably you know yeah maybe the north is population has more maybe you know maybe this uh, the genes coming from flowing from maybe east asia probably <laughs> so there is there is another theory by van riem like the coming out of like more since the, it's a very uh, ethnographically rich region so the van riem theory like that the people might have gone from this region so i don't know the exact uh, time frame uh, like what he suggested but uh, it's also on a like uh, genome studies of the races but uh, can you enlighten on that the time frame so, or you know, my my you know hunch is that you know we have very early evidence in north northeast of india so you know people from this region may have started moving towards southeast asia because the culture there you know the hobinian culture in southeast asia is much later compared to the evidence found in you know, in assam and you know in northeast in india so my you know uh, concept is that perhaps the northeast people maybe the ancestry maybe some distinct ancestry developed in that part and these people started moving towards towards 
maybe southeast asia further to korea also and so but you know we we are no scientific data yet to you know substantiate this view but this is my view view on the basis of the archaeological data that we are finding because we have we have very early data in northeast india and not that early in southeast asia not even in korea also but china has some very early evidence so maybe you know northeast and you know the yunnan province in china maybe the you know developments were happening simultaneously probably and then a lot of mixing was happening you know between this you no know, chinese and the you know, northeast people maybe at some stage so that is how you know maybe you know it looks like at the stage okay sir and another thing like the some in western or some some people still use some toys which are very similar features to harappan toys like still they made by hand yeah and, see uh, let, let me make one thing clear that you know even though maybe the ancestry may be slightly different but you know the right from the neolithic stage at least at this stage i can say that you know there is you know a lot of interaction between neolithic culture in you know in northeast neolithic culture of south india and other parts of india so right from the neolithic stage you know we were you know this uh, northeast india and the other parts of india they were well connected and right from neolithic stage it was a part of you know the greater part of the proper part of india only so only in maybe the ancestry we do not know but we know from culture that it is a part of you know very much part of indian culture right from the beginning uh, so from the chat uh, miss koel is asking uh, uh, can you talk about the lapidary industry that existed in rakhi gali lapidary uh, we have you know a lot of uh, beads of uh, semi precious stone particularly beads of uh, Uh, carnelian and uh, we have some evidence of the manufacturing activity also at Ka Ka uh, at rakhiri because we find a lot of chips we also find some beads which are unfinished some beads are broken some beads are, are finished so probably you know this we have not found the workshop yet of course there may be workshop somewhere but we have not found but they have done this you know maybe manufacturing of this then we also find beads of uh, Uh, banded agate also which were also manufactured at rakhiri so they must have got the raw material from maybe somewhere from on the border of uh, gujarat and rajasthan or from gujarat from gujarat and maharashtra border they must have got raw material through the different harappan settlements and then they produce you know goods here so we have that evidence certainly miss preeti is asking uh, if there were evidence of medicinal or medical trade or exchange of medical knowledge among the harappans and the civilization no we do not know much about the medical medicinal you know uh, properties uh, being developed that time but uh, probably the harappans knew the herbal you know medi medicine probably because at the site of kunal the botanists have identified some you know herbal you know herbal plants there so there is a possibility that you know if the harappans could introduce yoga science they could introduce them you know this meditation science they as well could have introduced even ayurveda also that time but we do not have sub substantial evidence at this stage but there is a indication that they have exploited some herbal plants maybe for medicinal purpose so that is a possibility Uh, Miss Mauli is asking if the Vedas were written by Harappan people, and I guess we have taken this. Uh, if if the Vedas were written by Harappan people and we have been able to read them, uh, why aren't we able to decipher the Harappan uh, Harappan inscriptions? See the Vedas, you know, we do we do not know when they were written, whether they were written during the Harappan Harappan times or you know later. I think you know my. Uh, understanding that perhaps you know they were you know written later because the knowledge that was created during the Harappan times that was passed on from generation to generation you know through oral tradition so that is quite clear so maybe you know at some stage you no know, they were you know they got uh, written some you know some somewhere but you know the script that we have in the Harappan level is completely different script it it is not similar to any Contemporary existing script at all, 
so we are not getting any breakthrough in the disciple of the harappan harappan you know script and uh, you know at this stage you know we have only hypothesis you know what maybe they had indo european script and language maybe they are dravidian script and language something like that we have only hypothesis but we are not getting a starting point unless we get some something like a rosetta stone in harappan level perhaps we will not be able to decipher that is what you know most of the scholars working on harappan script are feeling okay uh, miss sakshi is asking uh, if you can give any comments on the iron issue uh, which is usually connected with the coming of aryans uh aryan you know the aryan uh, say the iron in india the beginning of that goes back to at the most maybe 1500 to 1600 bc in the ganga plain there are some sites you know where you know they have got some dates on the on the early iron age culture which is going back to 1600 bc but most of the dates range from 1300 bc bc onward so in a real sense maybe the inventions was made maybe you know maybe around 1600 bc but the the use of iron in fact you know for the common people that started maybe after after 1300 bc only so if somebody thinks feels that no aryans came from outside and they brought iron with them then that may happen after 1300 bc only but again you know we do not get any evidence of that the evidence of maybe you know migration or invasion after even 1300 bc also uh so mr j is asking uh like did proto hindu religion grew with indus valley civilization or it goes back before indus valley civilization like proto shiva etc no no i think you know most of the religions emerge they, they they gave birth only after the harappans because in in the harappan levels we do find some elements you know which are keen which are close to some different religions probably you know these elements were created by the harappans not in the form of any kind of religion but they were just created as a form of art and later when the religions were born the hinduism jainism buddhism they started borrowing this concept from maybe harappans because they knew that you know that you know these things were created already by the harappans for example the shiva the concept of shiva you know maybe some you know maybe uh, gods you know in you know hindi in in hindu mythology like you know agni worship etc so probably it has come from the harappans because you have the early stages it was there we also find nude figurines probably the the, the concept of you know this uh, uh, nude you know uh, nude or the you know this uh, digambara concept may have also started from the from this even you know in we in the harappan levels we have at mohenjo there is a stupa and the stupa like structure is not it's not let later structure but it is harappan structure so probably you know the harappans could have maybe borrowed this type of structures from you know later in the later period so maybe the elements emerged in the harappan period but they were borrowed later in fact in respective religions that is what appears to be uh so now we would be taking the last question uh this is from miss sheetal she is asking is gagar river same as ancient saraswati river yes yes gagar today the name the modern name of the river is gagar today uh the, the part of that which flows in india and the same river goes to pakistan and pakistan it is called hakra so gagar hakra was the ancient river saraswati vaidik river saraswati Uh, so well this brings us to the end of our session uh, sir your talk was a visual treat as it enabled us to visit so many sites virtually i think it is extremely important to discuss the recent archaeological and genetic research which have been carried out at the largest harappan city of kakigadi and bring to focus the dna research indicating that the harappans were indigenous people who have authored most of the cultural developments including urbanization in this part of the world i once again thank our speaker and our audiences for your time and for being part of this live session uh, 
I mean, National Museum is currently closed for visitors, but we invite you to visit our collection online on the Jatin, Jatin portal. And of course, do follow us on social media. Have a good evening. Thank Happy you very much. Happy to everyone. Thank you so Same much. Thank you.